it occurred to me, Eddie, if I don't do something, I'm going to die out here. I'm going to die. I had a lot of fear, a lot of scared. You know, I was always watching behind my back who was looking for me, who was chasing me. Um, I, every time I hear a shot, I duck because I thought it was shooting at me and stuff like that, you know. Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Pacific Garden Mission is open to everyone. What demographic is here? There's young, there's old, there's rich, there's poor, the up and out, the out, uh, down and out. We are open to anybody who wants to come. Today we're going to focus on our Hispanic ministry, those that are ministering to the gospel to those who speak Spanish. It's an exciting program that we want you to watch, so we want to welcome you to Pacific Art of Mission. God bless you. I'm standing just inside of the men's security department, and behind me is the men's overnight guest area. Uh, we're excited today because the show is on a Spanish ministry and many of the men in our Spanish ministry who preach and teach and disciple others and bring those to saving life in Jesus Christ came through the mission homeless. In our first testimony, Eddie wants to share how he became homeless and how God answered his sincere prayer. And I started with, with one beer, a beer here and a beer there, a cigarette here and a cigarette there. And before I knew it, I lost my job. That's how I lost my apartment, my friends, my family, anyone and everyone that cared about me. And then I was homeless. I became homeless. And I knew I had to do something, but I didn't know what to do, where to go. I didn't have no purpose, no direction. I was truly lost. I came here and I joined the program after, after a day or two. And then 27 days later, I left. And what I did, I, 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 I lived two blocks from here, in the alley. September came, October came. By October, I asked some guys to bring me some blankets. They would bring me some blankets from here. And I started collecting blankets. When November hit, November 10th, November 15th, it got to be 10 below zero. With the wind chill factor about 20, and I felt it through the blankets. It occurred to me, Eddie, if I don't do something, I'm gonna die out here. I'm gonna die. That morning, November 19th, I woke up and I said, I was sorry to, to God. I said, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me, help me. Help me like you've helped me before and lifted me up and protected me because I'm alone and I don't want to die without having accomplished anything in this life. Help me. As soon as I said that, it was like he empowered me to come straight through these doors and I went straight to Office B and I sat down and I said, I need to sign, see somebody because I want back in the program. Uh, I was asked to, to participate in the Spanish ministries here. And so when I began to, to participate in the Spanish ministry, uh, 
a lot of Hispanic people here, Mexican or Cuban or, or, or whatever they were, Hispanic, most of them didn't know any English. And I knew Spanish. So in order for, for, for me to reach them, I was able to, to communicate and bring them to the Spanish program, to the Bible classes, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, where they can hear God's word. I work over here in, in the intake where the new guys come in at, and I can look at these, these guys in there that they're 50, 60, 70 years old. They have some type of illness. They're like towards the latter part of their life. And they've lived pretty much a lost life. You can see how broke they are. And I can look at any one of these guys and I feel compassion for them. And, I, and I'm moved to share with them what God has taught me, his word, his hope that despite how, how, how life has, what, what avenues you've experienced in this life, that it doesn't matter to him. He can lift you up. He can bring peace in your life. He can, he can put joy in your heart. He can make the impossible possible, just like he did for me. I'm sure you can appreciate how well Eddie can minister to those who come in here homeless and helpless who speak Spanish. Our next testimony is about David, who came from a missionary's family in Bolivia, led a rebellious lifestyle, and now is well equipped to minister to those who come in here homeless, helpless, and speak Spanish. Let's watch his testimony. I'm the son of a missionary parents. I was raised in the mission fields for about 17 years of my life. At the age of um, 15, when we were in La Paz, Bolivia, I became rebellious towards uh, the calling that my dad had uh, in the ministry. I didn't feel comfortable at that time uh, participating in, in the church. I, I had a lot of loss of family members uh, moving from country to country. And uh, in that area of my life, I was kind of like feeling a little empty. I came to Chicago uh, one time, we came back, and one of my cousins was a Latin king, a gang banger, and uh, he started giving me the influence of the gangs and streets, and I kind of liked it, you know, I kind of ran with the streets, and uh, I, I started gang banging during the daytime, and at nighttime, i go to church and be the choir boy and be the, the good pastor's son, quote unquote, you know. Um, started smoking weed, um, became more determined with the gang banging lifestyle. Me, as I was growing in the streets, I was just depending on the streets and the streets alone, you know, whatever was going on with the guys banging and selling dope and uh, running from police. I had a lot of fear, a lot of scared, you know, I was always watching behind my back who was looking for me, who was chasing me. Um, I, every time I hear a shot, I duck because I thought it was shooting at me and stuff like that, you know. People were really terrified of my lifestyle because I was a hardcore person, you know. I was the I was, uh, type of person that if, if you're going to do it, just do it. Uh, don't hesitate, you know. Uh, indulge yourself in it. I got married to so some beautiful Chicana girl that I saw here in Chicago. Had three beautiful kids, and, but I was involved in my addiction, heavy duty, you know. I was a contractor. I remodel homes for a living. I, you know, do a lot of that work. and. That's how I sustained myself. I was making good money, but I took money home, gave my money to my wife, said, here's the money for the bills, and here's the money for me to take off this weekend. And so I was always living that double lifestyle. And I know that God had a plan, for, even in spite of that, because um, I've been here 120 days, and I came here, my kids didn't know when I came. I just told them bye. I didn't even tell them goodbye. I just told them on their phone. I texted them. I said, look, I'm leaving. My daughter was visiting with her husband. He's locked up in prison. I, I, I was counseling with the pastors for the last three months about my situation with my kids, not communicating, not letting them know where I'm at right now. And I went to the office and I called my son, you know, uh, and my son, I told him, I'm here in Pacific Garden Mission. Come and see me. And 
He says, I'll be there to visit you Monday. So I got a call Sunday, not Monday, but Sunday. And he tells me, hey, Dad, where you at? I says, I'm in the office. He goes, can I see you? I says, sure. He goes, I said, where you at? He goes, I'm in front of the door. So he came, and we were sitting talking. And um, at that same time, it was, it was kind of awkward, just how God works. And my sister texts my son and tells my son, we find your father, he's in Pacific Garden Mission. And my son goes, yeah, I know, I'm right here with my dad. <laughs> so he's sending her a picture back about me here. So it's so kind of like, wow, how God really works when you allow God to work in your life and you let Jesus direct your steps and you listen to the man of God, amen? So I guess that's my testimony so far as of yet. <laughs> What makes the Spanish ministry exciting is that we have a team of men who are capable of leading services and having a wonderful time sharing the Word of God and leading others to Christ. Our next story is about Tony, who is no different. Well, I started going downhill when I started losing my family, little by little. Uh, first my mother, my stepdad, then my father, then my sister, and I lost uh, my wife after 18 years. I lost my daughter. That was, that was the last and my last boiling point for me, and the bottle became my friend. And for drinking, I don't, know, I don't even remember how many years. I found myself in a place I didn't want to be. Uh, I started living under bridges. I started living in people's attics, people's basements. Since walking through these front doors, uh, I was approached by a person named Angel. First thing he asked me, would you like to look like one of those guys with the suit and tie on? I said, I would love to look like that again. And I said, I'll give it a shot. I have nowhere to go, I had nothing to do. This was my last stop. Before I got here, I asked God to take me away. I didn't want to be here anymore. Um, I didn't know what I was going to get into, but once I got into the program, the Bible lessons were more about God than I knew. And the things that I've done in the past, I've always asked why I've done them. It was like one pastor said, let the past go. Because that's what I made my mistake going back to my past. That's how I got here. And when I came to the program, I met a bunch of guys that spoke practically the Bible. And I said, well, this got to be the place for me because anywhere else I was going, it was always talking about gangbanging, killing, shooting, uh, everything negative in life. And I didn't want to hear it. That's not even part of my life. They asked me to come in to the Spanish uh, ministry. And I kind of went there a couple of nights. I enjoyed myself there. Uh, there was a lot of different uh, people to meet there also. Um, uh, it was uh, pretty. Uh, informant. Uh, we, we were just starting out, so I was brand new into this. But they needed someone from the from the mission to uh, you know to bring in some more of the Spanish uh, coalition in there. So we we started doing that, and the coalition started growing, growing. Whenever I see uh, a troubled person, I will go to him. And if he looks like he has a big problem, I'll go to him and say, Do you know? Do you believe in Christ? Do you know you were saved by him? Do you know he died on the cross for our sins. And there's some things that they didn't, they didn't uh, understand. And I'll take out my Bible and I'll read a few chapters to them, verses, and uh, okay, you know, keep talking to me. You know, we'll sit there through lunchtime, through our break time or whatever. I mean, after um, school, sometimes they'll meet me on the side. Hey, you're the guy I wanted to talk to. And I'll go to the side with them in the hallway and we'll discuss a little bit more. Uh, I mean, they enjoy being taught a little bit more what they don't understand, just like I did. And basically that's, that's where, where I stand right now for my seven months that I've been here, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to go to my one year uh, um, mission here, uh, and I'm not turning back. My heart was so broken, my life was so messed up. Uh, I mean, before I got here, it was the end for me. I, I was tired of asking God for help, going around the same mountain over and over again. And finally he says, come through my doors and I'll show you how to go up that mountain. And I'm going up that mountain again. All of the men like Tony who are called into this ministry are very special here at Pacific Garden Mission. Our final testimony is Angel 
who had a calling about three years ago to begin the Spanish ministry here. It started out small and it grew. Angel was a homeless truck driver who is now employed at Pacific Garden Mission. His story is next. It's when you're losing somebody who's very dear to you, and you know that it is your fault, the reason why they're leaving. So, you know... I came uh, to Pacific Garden Mission in about uh, 2012, in January. Um, I was uh, in Madison, Wisconsin before then, and I decided to uh, try to get some help because things were going pretty bad for me. So I came to the mission and I started working in the kitchen at the beginning. And then from there I moved over to Office C, which I work uh, under the director um, of the men's Bible program. Um, as time went by, I, I noticed that there was a need for um, Spanish uh, counseling or Spanish uh, preaching so the services was in, in English, and I noticed a lot of men would come and to try to talk to another person who can't speak Spanish. Um, so as I saw the need, I started thinking about it. I remember getting together with the other men that were working in the office at the time. Uh, so we started doing devotions, uh, probably was about five, six guys at the most. And uh, we get together uh, once a week. Uh, it was on Thursdays, and it started somewhere in July of 2012. Then I wanted to do a service. I thought maybe we can do a service as well, just like the other services that we have here at night. So I pushed forward for that. Um, and of course I was a little nervous because I would have to preach and it was my first ever time you know, ever preaching. So I was a little nervous about that. But I, I pushed forward and uh, we started, we did our first service in July. So we started preaching on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. At the time there was more men that were coming into the mission that, was, that spoke Spanish and they were ministry minded. So um, I talked to them and uh, kind of interviewed them and asked them if they were interested in being part of the Spanish ministry. And of course that was, uh, that was pretty exciting for them. So uh, eventually uh, there was a man that came in, uh, his name is Javier. Um, he came in from Puerto Rico. I remember like uh, I got this uh, phone call and he was actually gonna be parole directly from Puerto Rico into Pacific Garden Mission. So I actually talked to his parole officer back in Puerto Rico, and, uh, and I told him, yes, this is the place where he'll be parole. He came here. Um, he graduated our program. He went all the way through the program, graduated, is still working with us in transportation. Uh, we have probably had at least a good 15, 20 men all together. They have come through the program and been part of the Spanish ministry. Whether it was reading the Bible, just leading someone to Christ, we have had a lot of men that actually accepted Christ through the Spanish ministry. Um, and uh, I think right now, almost everybody in that room, uh, when we get together, almost everybody has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So that's an awesome, that's an awesome uh, experience to lead someone to Christ and then pray for them. The Spanish ministry is something that, uh, it was in my heart from the beginning. I did get hired. Uh, here as a staff member to be head of the Spanish ministry. So that also opened the door for me to be employed here. And um, so I'm very grateful to God for that. And uh, now we also started just on Thursdays, uh, ESL, English as a Second Language. And uh, David Sintron is the one who's helping us with that as well. So some of the men are actually learning some English right now and we are hoping that they, as, as they learn more English, they might want to join the program someday. Um, that's the basic idea behind it, but also uh, whatever help they might need outside to be able to find work in a lot of places. Um, so we uh, have come through, uh, we, we are at a point right now where if they need IDs or if they need um, uh, a letter of residence that they stay in here, uh, we help them with those things. Um, so they, 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 ha they are becoming fully functioning followers of Christ. To those who are really doing something there, because some of these men are really following Christ. They, don't, they can't join the program maybe because of the language barrier or because uh, uh, they still want to work. But they actually I have seen a lot of changes in a lot of men. So that is, uh, that is very exciting for me. And uh, I, I don't think anything would have been accomplished or able to do if it wasn't because it was God's will. I believe it was God's will. It's been already three years and it's still going and I'm very excited, very excited.
Hope you've enjoyed the show on the Spanish ministry and there are many ministries here at Pacific Garden Mission. Many people come in here homeless and helpless, come through our programs, the New Day program and the New Life program, and they're raised to their highest potential by reading the Word of God, going to classes, learning a workplace ministry, and then becoming staff members here. Many of our staff members were once homeless themselves. Who better to serve those that come through our doors looking for hope and help and a way out of the situation they're in. We know there's only one way out and that's Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what would happen if an organization like Pacific Garden Mission wasn't in a major city like Chicago? The number of people that would stay out on the streets, homeless and helpless. We invite you to come alongside of us. If you'd like to pray for our ministry, we welcome that, we believe in prayer. If you'd like to come here to Chicago and volunteer, and if you'd like to sponsor someone with a monthly giving, you can do so on our secure website. Remember, you're not giving to the mission, you're giving through the mission to the people who need it the most. Those who come through our doors are being touched with every gift you give us. We'd ask you to come alongside of us, and as you do, may God bless you and keep you. Many of us face battles in our lives, and Pastor Phil is gonna to preach to us about spiritual battles. I also invite you to stay tuned at the end for a wonderful invitation of how you can receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Well, there's a story that's told by a man by the name of Leroy Imes. While he was serving in the Marines in the South Pacific in World War II, his amphibious vehicle just landed and it was hit by some enemy fire. The crew went out and they darted out of this vehicle. They just ran and they were running into various holes and they were approaching the airstrip of an enemy. When the sergeant looked over at Leroy and said, are you okay? And Leroy said, yeah, I'm fine, sergeant. And the sergeant said, where's your helmet? He said, oh man, he felt on top of his head and he said, I must be back in the vehicle, sir. He said, well, where's your belt? He said, oh, sir, it's probably back in the vehicle. He said, well, where's your rifle? He said, it's then I realized that in my haste to depart the, the vehicle that was under fire, I was approaching the enemy utterly unprepared. And I thought about that story, and we're going to look at that tonight, as Christian, I want you to realize something as we've been looking at the book of Joshua. We have an enemy that wants to see us destroyed. The Bible talks in the book of Ephesians that we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers, there's a, there's a spiritual world, a world that we don't even see. And sometimes I wish like Elisha's servant, our eyes would be open and we would see all that's going on around us. We have a real battle. And the Bible says the enemy has come to kill, to steal, and what? Destroy. To destroy. You have an enemy that is committed to your utter destruction. Much similar here as we saw in the book of Joshua as I've pictured in previous weeks that the leaving of Egypt pictures salvation, their emancipation, their freedom. But they went out into the wilderness and going into the promised land did not signify heaven but it signifies the victorious Christian life. Because as they were going to go into the promised land there was going to be some enemies there that were intent on destroying them. They were strong, they were powerful, they were armed. That's why the Bible says that we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. So again, I, I want you to take note tonight that you have an enemy that is going to use all means that is available to him to see your utter destruction. And what Joshua is doing here is before they have their first battle, which is the Battle of Jericho, we saw last week that they crossed over the River Jordan. And again, as I've previously stated, God's goal for you is not just to get you out of Egypt. It's not enough that you just stop doing stuff. God's goal for you was to live in the promised land, in a land flowing full of milk and honey, in a land of the promises of Almighty God. It's not that God just wants you to stop a certain behavior. God has so much more for many of you tonight. But in realizing that, when you cross over Jordan, there's going to be enemies. There's going to be people that are negative. There's going to be obstacles. 
There's going to be things that you're thinking and experiences that you have, and you're going to face certain things in your life that are going to cause you to want to go back to the wilderness and cause you to want to go back to Egypt. So what God does to his people here, and listen to me tonight, he prepares them for the battle. What I want to do with you tonight is give you some key points in preparation for the coming battle. God has brought you here for a reason. In summer, you are going to be engaged in a mighty battle. You've made a stand for Christ. You've testified and told others how Jesus Christ has changed your life. And I want to tell you, there's a land of the promises of God. There's a land flowing full of milk and honey. There's a land of blessing. But my friend, in order for you to get there, you need to be prepared. But I like the first thing what he does is look, if you would, at Joshua chapter 4. It came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you out twelve men of the people out of every tribe a man. And command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in there, the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Look down if you would to verse 7. And then ye shall answer them, and uh, that were... Uh, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel for how long? So when they were to pass over, they were to take some of the stones, 12 stones, and place them in the river. And it says in the text, they were to stand as a what? A memorial. So they would remember, look down if you would in verse 20. Look down if you would in verse 20. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. Look if you would to verse 23. And the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which were dried up from before us until we were gone over that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. He says, I want you to put 12 stones and they commemorate what God has done. Because he knew going forward, there was going to be some times where they would have doubt. There would be some times of fear. Here they are coming out of Egypt and facing cities that were walled, facing armies that were strong in chariots and spears and giants. He knew what was coming in the coming days, but in order for them to be prepared, he wanted to remind them of God's faithfulness in the past. If God is faithful to bring you out of Egypt, if God was faithful to part a Red Sea, if God is faithful to feed you manna when you were hungry, if God is faithful to give you water when you're thirsty, if God is faithful to, to part the Jordan when you want to walk over, if God has been faithful in the past, God will care for you in the future. Amen. You know, sometimes I look, and, and I do tonight quickly, I did want to share a little bit of my testimony because when I look back, it really encourages me to go forward. Many of you know I'm, you know, I'm from Chicago, the south side, south side. I was raised, my, my parents are good, godly, the best parents in the world. I was raised in a Catholic home. Knew about God, but I never knew God personally. I was working as a, uh, as a phlebotomist in a blood bank in Tinley Park, and one of the fellow nurses, she was a phlebotomist, her name was Cosette Davis, she was, she was a Christian. I, I knew something different about her, and she would come to work, and she would talk about God and Jesus, and, and she, she mentioned to me about the rapture. I never heard about the rapture. You know, I, was, I went to Catholic school, I went to Brother Rice on 99th and Pulaski, and I was just kind of an aimless kid, not certain about my future, but this lady began to talk to me about Jesus. And I began to question and wonder, why do I believe what I believe? Or do I believe? And one day, it was the Mother's Day, 1984, she said, why don't you come to church one day? And her church was on 107th and Vincennes. 
And she said, well, why don't you come to church? She said, you know, you, you know, you'll feel comfortable. It's a mixed congregation. Don't worry. Just come to church and listen. And so I said, okay. I remember I got to church, and what she didn't tell me is I was the one to make the congregation, uh, congregation mix for the day. Amen. <laughs> and again, I've never been outside a, a Catholic church my, uh, in my whole life. I've never been in another church besides a Catholic church. It was a new experience. So I walk in there, and she says, why don't you come down near the front? I'm thinking, I could just sit here in the back. You know, I'm cool. I'm good with this. No, come on down. Oh, man, like the third row or something. And so I sit down there, try to be inconspicuous, and the pastor gets up. His name is Bishop Lee. Any visitors here, tell us your name and the church you're from. I don't think, I ain't standing up. You kidding me? She elbows me. Stand up. Tell your name. So, oh, man. So my name is Phil Kwiatkowski from St. Catharines, and I sit back down. But that guy preached a gospel message. He preached about being born again. And I remember one phrase he said is, why don't you do your mother the greatest favor you can this Mother's Day? And that's by coming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. He says, why don't you come forward? And he gave an invitation at the end. And I thought, there is no way possible. I am not going forward. And she elbows me again. <laughs> Cosette says, Phil, why don't you go forward? I said, man, I'm good. She said, no one. I said, okay. So I said, why don't you go with me? So we both make our way towards the aisle, and she sits back down, and I'm kind of hung out to dry. So I, I, I walked down the aisle, and the pastor was there. But that day I prayed, through. I realized for the first time I knew about God, but I wanted to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. I always thought, well, as long as I was a good person and the good maybe outweighed the bad, and I tried to keep the commandments, it wasn't about trying to keep the commandments. I already broke them. I needed to know forgiveness through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. God saved me that day. God saved me that day when I walked down an aisle. And when I, when I look at the future, when I think about what's going on in the future, I, I look at that as one of my stones. God led me there that day for a specific purpose. And for some of you here today, God led you through these doors and he led you through events in your life for a specific purpose. And if you want a question going forward in the future, remember what God has done in the past. Well, I remember I graduated from a, a Moraine Valley way down on 111th Street and I was enrolled at Governor State University and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was sitting in class one day and I was reading a book on Psalms and Proverbs and a fellow student whispers to me, she says, Phil, you don't belong here. And I said, you know what, you're right. And I walked out of there. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I dropped out of college. I remember I got a, I got a summer job, a temporary job at a factory on 51st and Central. If you ever work in a factory, that is rough work. But I never forget this. You know there's always those moments in your life where you, there's a fork in the road and you can go two ways. I remember I, I left the job, and it was a summer job. It was August, and I was 22 years old. And I remember I left there, and I was sitting in, in my car, my parents' car, it wasn't mine, sitting in my car, and I thought, here I am, 22 years old. I dropped out of school. I'm unemployed, and I live in my mama's bedroom watching White Sox games. I said, boy, I'm a loser. I said, man, what am I going to do in life? And I cried out to God. I said, God, I, 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 you saved me at that church. You brought me there for a reason. In 1984, I walked down an aisle, and, and you led me there. And I know here I am now, a year later, and yes, I've dropped out of school, and this job has ended. I live in my parents' house. I'm not sure where I'm going to go, but I, leave, I believe you are a God who is faithful to your word and faithful to your promises. I'm going to trust you. That's a stone of remembrance. And there's some of you tonight, God has led you here for a purpose. And some can go two ways right now. You can go the way that you've always gone and always get the same results. And God is calling some of you tonight to a different level. He's calling you somewhere else. You might not be certain right now. You might not be sure. But God has a plan and a calling and a purpose in your life. It's no mistake that God led you here. Well, I remember I... Got a job as a janitor in Palis Heights. There I was in Palis Heights as a janitor. A fellow from church told me about it, and I got the job and cleaning floors and whatnot. And I started taking classes at Moody in the evening school. Still not sure what I wanted to do. And 
said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I felt, you know, I really should go forward and maybe I should apply. So I applied to Moody Bible Institute. I'll never forget it. And I got the letter back and I saw the mail and letter from Moody Bible Institute. This is God's will for my life. I got it and it wasn't positive. My grades were poor previously and they were. I could care less about school. But now I cared because I, I was a child of God. And Moody wrote me and said, well, we don't want you. And I remember that, that, that moment. I thought, oh, well, man, Lord, what am I going to do? So I wrote him back. I said, you know, I want to tell you something. God did a work in my life. I didn't care before. Now I care. I, it didn't matter to me before. Now it matters. And they wrote me back and they said again, you know what? If you really want to come here, go to summer school and prove yourself. And I did. And I stand here today. Amen. When I look back on those moments, and that's what God, with some of you listen to me tonight, I, and many of you, you look at your stories. And Lydia shared a testimony about a hospital. But I want to tell you, Lydia, God has brought you forward. And God has delivered you in the past. And God can deliver you in the future. I think of some of you tonight. I think, Tanya, I know your story. God has delivered you in the past. God has cared for you in the past. He can take care of you in the future. Phil, I remember when I met you 20 years ago, just got saved. Drug addict from Indiana. I went down there preaching with the mission. They introduced me to this dope fiend that got saved. Many people in the town said, man, he'll never last. He'll never make it. Here he is 20 years later. Hallelujah. <laughs> Phil, you remember when you had cancer? What happened? God delivered. That's another stone. Some of you tonight. And that's what God was telling the children of Israel. Yes, you're going to face some uncertain days. You're going to face some times in the future of doubt. But I want you to come back and look at these rocks in the River Jordan. I want you to remember when you were a slave in Egypt, how God brought you out. I want you to remember how the Red Sea was parted. I want you to remember the taste of the water out of the rock. I want you to remember the manna that came down when you were hungry. I want you to remember who I am, that I'm a God that delivers. You can face anything in the future, any walled city and any giant, because I've been there in the past you know there's some of you here tonight that can tell me stories that you should have been dead you can testify of times in your life there's no human explanation or reason that you're sitting here and my challenge to you if God spared you and allowed you to stay here God has a reason for you and if God spared you there is no obstacle in the future that can stop you because we serve a faithful God I think of what the Bible says in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, when Jeremiah was absolutely down and discouraged. Lamentations, chapter 3. Let, let me read this to you. The city was destroyed. The nation was in ruin. The people were taken captive. He says in verse 19, Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall in my mind, Therefore have I hope. Amen. Well, what's the one thing that you recall in your mind, Jeremiah? Your city's been destroyed. Your people are taken captive. The smoke is billowing up behind you of the ruins of the town. What one thing can you recall, Jeremiah, and have hope? It is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not, for they are new every morning. What does he say? Great is thy faithfulness. Don't you love that song? Great is thy faithfulness. There's some of you, you can look at your life, but I want you to look at the rocks as a memorial to the times in your life that God has delivered you. The times that you should have been dead, the times you were sick and maybe the doctor told you that it's over for you, the time for your children that they said that there was no hope, I want you to look back and remember those times. And I want to ask you, when you question going forward in the future and have doubts about the ability of God, just look in the past. Great is thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. Look back, if you would, to Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. Preparation for 
the enemy. Joshua is preparing the children of Israel. Number one, remember God's faithfulness. And again, some of these I'll go through uh, rather fast. But Joshua chapter 5, verse 2, he says here, we'll start in verse 1. It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of the Jordan westward, and all the kings and the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart was melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. So first point is remember what God has done in the past. And the second one is remember not to trust your flesh. I like what the Bible here says. I'll quote you Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. For in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He spiritualizes it, is it there? And I think for some of us, in order to face the enemy, when the Bible talks about having no confidence or trusting in the flesh, I think of Romans chapter 7, what the Apostle Paul says. I'll read it to you, Romans chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. No good thing. Right. Christian, I want you to remember this tonight. God never saved your flesh. Amen. God did not save your flesh. The same flesh that you had before salvation is the same flesh you had after salvation. The same likes you had before salvation is the same flesh that things your flesh likes after salvation. Now, the moment I got saved, I didn't get better at math. I didn't, get, I didn't become a better athlete. Why? Because my flesh is my flesh. My spiritual relationship to God changed. I was now a child of God. He gave me the, the Holy Spirit, but my flesh is still my flesh. And the reason I believe this is spoken of is when you go into the promised land, don't be tempted to fight the enemy with your own strength. Well, we can go ahead and maybe if we take out our spears, if we take out our swords, if we go ahead and get armament. No, that's not going to do it. How many people fail? And I see it time and time again. Guy gets saved, learns his first verse. You know, uh, Jesus wept. Amen. He's doing great. Got his first Bible verse. Then all of a sudden now, two weeks into salvation, I think I can handle it. Uh, you know, I, I can go in the old neighborhood. I know I used to get high and all that stuff, but I'm strong now. I memorized the first verse of the Romans road. I know Romans 3.10. I can handle it. Point is, you can't handle it. That's why in Romans chapter 7, over, over 36 times the word I is used in regards to the apostles' failures. And if we would stand here tonight and think, I can handle my addiction. I can handle my struggles. I can handle my situation. I can go by my old girlfriend or my old boyfriend, and now that I'm saved, and I can witness to them and tell them about Christ because I can handle it. Oh, I know I used to smoke weed, but now that I'm saved, that's okay if I go home and everybody else is doing it, and there's my drunken uncle in the back. That's okay. I'm strong now. Well, what's that smell? Wow. Hold on a second. The point is... You can never get victory in the power of your flesh. Never. Don't fool yourself. God's means are unconventional. We're not going to see it tonight, but when they go to the city of Jericho, the first city, what God does is he tells them to march around it. Really, that's your plan? Can you imagine? Let's go attack a city. Great march and blow a trumpet. Are you serious? Let's go ahead and let's, let's, let's count our troops. Let's get a battle plan. Should we attack this wall and you attack this wall? Martin, maybe you get something and get over there and get the chariots. Jimmy, you get this side. That, no, just march and blow. Okay, really? That's all you got? That's all I need when I have God. Amen? That's all I need. Don't trust your flesh. Well, he goes on over there. Let's look at the next one quickly if we would. Look, if you would, to verse 10 of chapter 5. He says here in verse 10 of chapter 5, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th month of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover and unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self-same day. 
What did he say? Remember your community. The, the Passover was a time where they would meet together, much like in the early church. You know, the word for communion is a Greek word, koinonia, which means to participate or communion, to share together. You see, how many times I've heard it from people when all of a sudden when they are here, they get saved, and maybe someone's in church, and they're not in church for a while, and you see them two years later, and they're not living for God, and you say, what happened? Well, I, always, I stopped reading my Bible, and I stopped going what? Church. church. Christian, we need each other. We need each other. We, we need to pray for each other. We need to encourage each other. We, we, we need to be there for one another. And that's what he's talking about. He says you need to celebrate the Passover as a community here. We need to be together as the people of God. There's somebody here tonight that doesn't need a finger of condemnation. They need somebody to put their arm around them and encourage them and pray for them and ask them how they are. We need each other. That's what he's talking about, preparing for the enemy. Look, if you would, to verse 12 of chapter 5. Verse 12, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now I find that interesting. This generation was brought up with manna. That's all they knew. They would go out there in the morning, manna. They'd go out there in the next morning, manna. Now there was one morning they walk out there, hey, no manna. Why did it cease? Because God wanted them to learn to live by faith. That's what God wanted them to do. When you look at this here, why did God do that? And he says in the text, he says, uh, after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. God says, I have some corn, I have some fruit, I have something for you here, and you need to learn to live by faith. What is the only defensive weapon when you think of the whole armament? It talks about the shield of what? Faith. Shield of faith. You see, when Satan throws those fiery arrows at you, and he's going to throw them at you, arrows of doubt, arrows of discouragement, Arrows of temptation, arrows of uncertainty, oh, arrows of the past. And what you need to do is put up the shield of faith. I believe my God is able. I believe my God has power. I believe. I think of the, the, the three children of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what they told Nebuchadnezzar. He said, our God is able, and even if he doesn't, we won't bow our knee. Hallelujah. I believe in what God says in his word. And if you believe God calls you, and that's why when I look back at these stones, I remember, yes, there was doubt. I remember I was thinking about going to Moody, and the doubt came in. What are you going to do going to a Bible school? Who's going to hire you from a Bible school, man? Remember when I was working as a janitor, they came and they offered me a promotion. A head janitor, I mean, you know. I'll clean the mayor's toilet, I mean, you know. But I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should stay. I don't know. What am I going to I had to go forward in, in what? And that's what God wants some of you to do. He wants you to cross the Jordan. There's some you're always looking back. You're on the verge of leaving and going back. And, but you would never have known what's over on the other side if you didn't cross over in faith. They never would have known what it was like to eat of the fruits. They wouldn't have known what it was like to, to have the, all the beauty of the land, all the great kings, David and Solomon, and all that was going to take place in this land for generations to come. They would have never known it if by faith they just didn't stand over. And some of you tonight need by faith to step over. And when Satan throws those arrows at you, you'll never make it. You know what your background is. You can't overcome. You've always been that way. I got to put up my shield of faith and say, I trust the promises of Almighty God. I believe my God is able. I believe His promises are true. And I trust in what His Word says. I pick up my shield of faith. Yes, the man has stopped. Well, get out there and eat of the corn, eat of the fruit of the land, because God has something so much more for you. And some of you tonight, God has something so much more. Last point, look if you would at chapter 5, verse 13. 
It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said to him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? He said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servants? And the captain of the Lord, a host, said to Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is what? Holy. Is holy. What's the last step in preparation and meeting the enemy? Remember to meet with your God. And that's what Joshua did here. He met with his God. I want to ask some of you, do you really get alone with God? Uh, you know, when you look at some of the great people of the Word of God, what some of you need to do is go somewhere and shut out all the voices you hear. And like Joshua, meet with God. One thing I was reading about enemy warfare, the enemies try to do two things in warfare. They try to shut off your food supplies and your communication supplies. Those two things. And as I said, he wants to shut off your food, and that's the Word of God. And he wants to shut off your communication so you won't be able to talk with the commander. I, I love Psalm 73 when, when David was uh, uncertain about the prosperity of the wicked. He was confused. He was frustrated. He says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Until I got alone with God. You know what I encourage you to do every day? Take a section of scripture. Take a proverb. Take a chapter of Proverbs. On the first, read Proverbs chapter 1. On the second, read Proverbs chapter 2. Get along with God and pray and seek God and ask God for God's will for your life. Where am I going? And that's how you get to know somebody by spending time with them. He is preparing them to meet the enemy. And I want to prepare some of you tonight. You are going to face uncertain times. You are going to face an enemy bent on your utter destruction. The enemy wants you back. The enemy wants you destroyed. How do I prepare? I look in the past. God, you have been faithful to me. I remember those times when there's no human explanation. You delivered me. How can I prepare for the enemy? Lord, I, I can't trust in my flesh. I can't trust in my natural ability because there is no ability. I need to trust in the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of me. How, how do I prepare to face the enemy? I need to remember my community. You need to be in church. Yeah, yourself. You need to be fellowshipping. You need to have a group of people as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another. You need to pray with some people. You need to talk with some people. How do I prepare for the enemy? I need to remember I walk by faith. Oh, when I don't see it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to take God at his word that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to take God at his word. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. I'm going to take God at his word that he will not withhold any good thing from me. I'm going to take God at his word because that's what he said. And I'm going to fend off the darts of the enemy. Amen. And I'm going to remember lastly, to make sure that I meet with God myself. Sometimes we can get so busy serving God, we forget who God is. To get alone somewhere and meet with God. Why don't we have every head bowed and every eye closed. We close the service tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, and maybe this is your moment that God has led you to, you say, Pastor, I need to get saved. I had that moment, that's one of my rocks. I remember it. This is your moment. God led you through, through these doors. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't chance. God led you here for a specific purpose, and this is the purpose. I had no idea when I walked down an aisle on 107th and Vincent on May 13th, 1984, what would happen in my life. I could have walked out that door and gone back to my same old life, or I could have stepped forward, and what an adventure it's been. There's some of you tonight, God is calling you forward. You can go back into the wilderness. You can go back into Egypt. 
But God has something so much more. If you're here tonight, say, Pastor, tonight I want to make that decision to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Raise up your hand. I want to pray for you all across the auditorium. Raise it up. Amen. Amen. Don't be shy. You have no idea what journey is ahead of you. But you got to come over Jordan. You have no idea what's in front of you. We know what's behind us. Anybody else? Anybody else? You never know if you don't step. Father, I pray for those that have raised their hands that tonight that you give them the strength and the courage to make the most important decision that they could ever make is receiving you as Savior. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith. The key word is there is through faith. You've just heard a message about mixing faith with the promises of God. And that's what salvation is all about. Sometimes we hear religious words thrown around, I'm saved. What does I'm saved mean? It means I've come to a point in my life where I've trusted Jesus Christ and Jesus alone for my soul's salvation. Again, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in what God has promised us. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's that word saved again. What does it mean? Saved from the eternal penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? Hell. Who's going there? All of us without Jesus Christ. During the next moment, I want to invite you to make a life-changing decision. If the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, I'm asking you to believe the promise of God. Would you do that right now? Would you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Your good works won't save you. Your church won't save you. The Ten Commandments, as good as they are, will not save you. Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins, that's what saves you. Bow your head with me right now and pray something simple. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know as a sinner I deserve help, but this moment I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Forgive me in Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, would you write us, call us, let us know. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you watch the TV program every week and it's been a great encouragement to you. There's a number there. There's an address there. Would you write us and tell us the encouragement that we have been to you? God bless you and thank you for watching.